Welcome to our deep learning lecture. We are now in part four of the introduction. Now in this fourth path, we want to talk about machine learning and pattern recognition. And first of all, we have to introduce a bit of terminology and notation. We are standing on the shoulders of the giants who in the past um, simplified the problem of problem solving so much that now we have a chance to do the final step. So throughout this entire lecture series, we will use the following notation. So matrices are bold and uppercase, so examples here are M and A. And vectors are bold and lowercase, examples V, X. Scalars are italic and lowercase, uh, Y, W, alpha. Uh, and for the gradient of a function, we'll use the gradient symbol. For partial derivatives, we'll use the partial notation. Furthermore, uh, we have some specifics about deep learning. So the trainable weights will generally be called W. Uh, features, inputs are X. They're typically vectors. Then we have the ground truth label, which is Y. We have some estimated output, that is Y hat. And if we have some iterations going on, we typically do that in a superscript and put it into brackets. Uh, this is an iteration index here, iteration i for the variable x. Of course, this is a very coarse notation, and we will further refine it throughout the lecture. The stuff that works best is really simple. If you have attended previous lectures of our group, then you should know the classical image processing pipeline, or pattern recognition pipeline, we do the recording where the sampling and the uh, analog to digital conversion takes place. Then you have the pre-processing, uh, feature extraction, followed by classification. And of course, in the classification step, uh, you have to do the training. The first part of the pattern recognition pipeline is covered in our lecture, Introduction Pattern Recognition. The main part of classification is covered in pattern recognition. So that stuff that's really stood the test of time. Now what you see in this image is a classical image recognition problem. Let's say you want to differentiate apples from pears. Now one idea that you could do is you could draw a circle around them and then measure the length of the major axis. So you will recognize that apples are round and pears are longer. So their ellipses have a difference in the major and minor axis. Now you could take those two numbers and represent them as a vector value. Then you enter a two-dimensional space. Which is basically a vector space representation summing up uh, the input from all sensors. Th that doesn't, does not show any pictures. In which you will find that all of the apples are located on the diagonal through the x-axis because if they're diameter in one direction increases, also the diameter in the other direction increases, while your pairs are off this uh, straight line because they have a difference in their two uh, minor and major axes. Now, you can find a line that separates those two, and there you have your first classification system. With, say, image recognition or something like that? Now, what many people think how the big data processing works is shown in the small figure. So, is this your machine learning system? Yep. Pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. And what if the answers are wrong? Ah, just stir the pile until they start looking right. And then, if you're, you know, if you're a development engineer, or if you're, you know, if you're, if you have the development build like I do, then you can see. Uh, you know, all the debug information. But those would just be like total gibberish to most people. Right. So what you can see in this picture is that, of course, um, this is how many people think that they approach deep learning and you just pull the data in and in the end you just stir a bit and then you get the right results. But that's not actually how it works. Reminder, what you want to do is you want to build a system that runs a classification, which means that from your measurement, you first have to do some pre-processing, like reduce noise, you have to get a meaningful image, then do a feature extraction, 
and from that you can then do a classification. Now the difference to deep learning is that you put everything into a single kind of engine. So this does the pre-processing, the feature extraction, and the classification just in a single step. I already kind of think of neural nets as a kind of, of program. I think of deep learning as basically learning programs that have more than one step. And you just use the training data and the measurement in order to produce those systems. Now, this has been shown to work in a lot of applications, but as we've already talked about in the last video, you have to have the right data and you cannot just pour some data in and then stir until it starts looking right. You have to have a proper data set, a proper data collection, and if you don't do that in the appropriate way, you just get nonsense out. I'm, I'm optimistic about what can happen just with more computation and more data. Uh, I do think it'll be important to get the right kind of data. Of course, we have a couple of postulates and those postulates uh, also apply in the regime of deep learning. So in classical pattern recognition, we are following those postulates. So the first postulate is that there's a variability of representative sampling patterns. And those sampling patterns are given in the, um, in the class, in the problem domain omega here, and you have training examples for all of those classes and they are representative. So it means that if you have a new observation, they will be similar to those patterns that you already collected. The next postulate is that there is uh, a simple pattern, and the simple pattern has features, and these features characterize the membership to a certain class. So you have to be some way, somehow be able to process the data such to derive those abstract representation, and with this representation, you can then derive the class and the classifier. Furthermore, features of the same class should be compact in the feature domain. So this means that features of different classes, they should be apart from other classes, while features of the same class should be close to each other. So what you want to have ideally is a small intra-class distance and a high inter-class distance. Examples are shown here in this figure below. So the top left one is a very nice and easy example. Uh, the one in the center is also solvable. It gets harder for the third one. Uh, and of course, then you can still separate them by a nonlinear boundary. Uh, more complicated is the case on the bottom left because here the classes are intermixed and you want to essentially draw regions around those classes. They may also be very intertwined but still separable. And then, of course, uh, you could have data where it's very hard to figure out which part of goes to which class. And typically, if you have a situation like the bottom right, uh, you don't have a very good feature representation and you want to think whether you don't find better features. Or what many people do today is they just say, oh, let's go to deep learning and just learn an appropriate representation that then will do the trick. We are happy that it works better than any competing method. So a complex pattern consists of uh, simpler constituents which have a certain relation to each other. And the pattern may be decomposed into those parts. Furthermore, a complex pattern has a certain structure. And not every arrangement of simpler parts gives a valid pattern. And many patterns can be represented with relatively few parts. And of course, two patterns are similar if the features of simpler parts differ only slightly. Okay, having seen those bas basic postulates of pattern recognition, we will see that many of them still apply also in the world of deep learning. Uh, however, we don't see that really how the things are decomposed. Instead, we build systems that gradually simplify the input such that you decompose them into parts and better representations. Now, let's start with the very basics. The perceptron is the basic unit that you will find in most neural networks. And the reason why people are very excited about perceptrons, actually when they are introduced uh, by Rosenblatt in the 1950s, they, people got really excited because uh, Rosenblatt had this nice relation of this neuron to a biological neuron. Now, a biological neuron 
uh, is connected by synapses to other neurons, and the sum of incoming excitatory and inhibitory activations, if they are large enough, then the actual neuron is firing. And uh, it's firing if you have a certain potential that is over a, a threshold. Then it's transmitting information. And it's typically an all or none response, which means that uh, if you have a higher stimulus and you exceed the threshold, it doesn't mean that it causes a higher response. Yeah? It either fires or it doesn't fire, so it's essentially a binary classifier. This concept can rather easily be transformed into a vector representation. Of the world in vector space. Um, but I think this is very difficult for people to, normal people to understand. They would not know what the heck they're looking at. Now this is what Rosenblatt did. He essentially uh, devised a system that takes an input vector that is specified here by input values x1 to xn, and you added some bias 1 here. Uh, you multiply them with weights, add them up, and then you have an activation function that either fires or doesn't fire. And here, uh, for sake of simplicity, we can simply take the sine function. So whether if you have a, a positive activation, you fire. If you have a negative activation, you don't fire. Yeah? So this could be uh, symbolized by the sine function. Now, um, this then leads to a rather problematic uh, training procedure. Um, of course, if you want to train now, you need to have uh, tuples of observations and the respective class. Uh, this is your training data set. And then uh, you need to determine the set M of the misclassified feature vectors. Uh, so these are the vectors where the predicted number y hat does not match the actual class membership yi if you compute the output of the neuron. Now, if you have the set m that has to be determined uh, after each step of the training iteration, uh, then you try to minimize the following optimization problem. The problem that describes your misclassification is essentially the sum over all your misclassified samples where you compute the output of your actual network and the output of the network is then multiplied by the true class membership so because uh, the two don't match it means uh, this must be negative and then you multiply it with minus one in order to create a high value for a lot of misclassifications, and you seek to minimize this term, essentially. This then leads uh, to an optimization procedure where you have an iterative procedure. So this iterative optimization then has to determine an update, a gradient step for the weights. And once you updated the weights, you have to determine the set of misclassified vectors again. Now the problem with this is that in every iteration the cardinality of the composition of M may change because with every step you have more or fewer uh, misclassifications and you can actually compute the gradient uh, of the function with respect to the weights and it's simply the input vector multiplied with the correct class minus one and this would give you the update uh, towards the weight. Now if you calculated this gradient Strategy one would be process all of the samples and then perform the weight update. Or strategy two is you take an update step after each misclassified sample and then directly update the weights. So you get an update rule for each iteration where the misclassified sample then simplifies to the uh, old weights are the misclassified sample multiplied with the class membership and added to the weights and this gives you the new weights. Now you optimize until convergence for a predefined number of iterations. This very simple procedure has a number of disadvantages, which we will look at at a later point in this class. So in the next lecture, we want to look at a couple of organizational matters that are important uh, if you want to obtain the certificate. And uh, we will look into a short summary of the four videos that you've seen so far. I hope you liked this video and hope to see you next time. Thank you.